announcements before we begin. As we assemble in separate spaces, we recognize that for thousands of years, the land on which we find ourselves has been a sacred gathering place for many peoples of Turtle Island. We respectfully recognize that wherever we are, we are on traditional territories of indigenous nations who continue to cry out for justice. May each of us who gather this day commit to listen, to learn, and to work to right the wrongs of the past. Now I'd like to hand it over to Principal of Emmanuel College, Michelle Voss Roberts. Thank you, Sean. For those of you who have been involved in the conference, um, I, I hope you know that the person who is just speaking is uh, Sean Kazabowski Houston, who, um, along with Wendy Cranston, has um, been working tirelessly so that this conference can happen. So thank you, Sean. Thank you, Wendy. My name is Michelle Voss Roberts. I'm the principal of Emmanuel College. We are one of the hosts of the Christian Left Conference through our Center for Religion and its Contexts. In addition to this virtual space, Emmanuel College inhabits a beautiful gray stone building fronting Queens Park Crescent in downtown Toronto. I'm telling you this because you were supposed to be with us <laughs> on campus. Emmanuel is one of two colleges of Victoria University in the University of Toronto and one of seven member schools in the Toronto School of Theology, which offers degrees conjointly with the U of T. We are a theological school of the United Church of Canada that prepares people for ministry in our Master of Divinity and Master of Sacred Music programs. And we also have a thriving multi-religious Master of Pastoral Studies program with spiritual care tracks for Christian, Muslim and Buddhist students. If this conference has inspired you to consider further study, such as a PhD or Doctor of Ministry, please take a look at our graduate programs. You can study with diverse and accomplished faculty at Emmanuel across the Toronto School of Theology and in the University of Toronto. In 2019, the University of Toronto was named number one in Canada and number 11 internationally for theology, divinity, and religious studies by the QS World University Rankings. Toronto is also listed as one of the top three student-friendly cities in Canada. Of course, the circumstances of the global pandemic and closed borders prevent us from welcoming you in person. We hope someday to welcome you to Toronto for the full experience we had envisioned with opportunities to visit with elected local and national leaders and to experience Toronto's distinctive neighborhoods. Along with Emmanuel College, Representatives of the sponsors of the Christian Left Conference are Kyle Gingrich Hebert of the Toronto Mennonite Theological Center, Rob Dalglish from the EDGE Network in the United Church, and the Reverend Dr. Sherry DeNovo, Minister at Trinity St. Paul's Center for Faith, Justice, and the Arts. This conference is really her brainchild. So in a moment, I will invite her to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Jorg Rieger. But first, allow me to say a few words about the person for whom this lectureship at Emmanuel College is named. Ernest Crossley Hunter, his dates are 1889 to 1966, was a Methodist slash United Church minister known as an outstanding preacher. Son of the famous evangelist, John Hunter, E. Crossley Hunter was born in St. Thomas, Ontario in 1889. He studied at Victoria University, was ordained in 1911 and served pastoral charges in Ontario, including Trinity United Church in Toronto, now Trinity St. Paul's, one of our partners, and United Church, uh, Knox United Church in Winnipeg. 
the coming together of Trinity St. Paul's and Emmanuel with our other sponsors for this conference is a particularly apt way to honor his legacy. Crossley Hunter served as president of the Toronto Conference in 1953 and was a founder of the Canadian Council of Christians and Jews. He was married to Mabel Dunbar in 1915. She died in 1958, and in 1959, he married Stella Drake. He retired in 1958. This lectureship was established in 1952 by Ernest Crossley Hunter and his sons and was named the Hunter Crossley Lectureship in Evangelism in, member, in memory of John Edwin Hunter and Hugh Thomas Crossley. After his death, the lectureship was renamed the Ernest Crossley Hunter Memorial Lectureship in his honor. This year's Ernest Crossley Hunter Memorial Lecturer is Professor Jorg Rieger, and I invite the Reverend Dr. Sherry DeNovo to introduce him. Thank you, Michelle, and uh, welcome everyone. This year's Ernest Crossley Hunter Memorial Lectureship features, as you just heard, keynote speaker, uh, Jorg Rieger, founding director of the Wendland Cook Program in Religion and Justice and distinguished professor of theology at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Rieger is Distinguished Professor of Theology and the Cal Turner Chancellor's Chair of Wesleyan Studies at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. He is also the founding director of the Wendland Cook Program in Religion and Justice there. He received his Master of Divinity degree in Germany and did his graduate work, including a PhD in Religion and Ethics at Duke University. For more than two decades, he has worked to bring together theology and the struggles for justice and liberation that mark our age. He is the author and editor of 22 books and over 140 academic articles. His work addresses the relation of theology and public life, reflecting on the misuse of power in religion, politics, and economics. His main interest is in developments and movements that bring about change and in the positive contributions of religion and theology. His constructive work in theology draws on a wide range of historical and contemporary traditions with a concern for manifestations of the divine and the pressures of everyday life. His recent books include Jesus versus Caesar for people tired of serving the wrong God, 2018. He is also editor of two academic book series, New Approaches to Religion and Power with Palgrave Macmillan Publishers and Religion in the Modern World with Roman and Littlefield. I also want to say that I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, Dr. Rieger on uh, the Radical Reverend show. And so you can tune in if you want to hear more of him on iTunes or SoundCloud and listen to that interview. His lecture today is titled The Circular Firing Squads of the Left, Notes for Christians and Other Seekers Not Looking for Easy Answers. He has kindly pre-recorded his lecture and will entertain your questions live at the conclusion of the lecture today. Now you can ask those questions using the chat box as we have on the other panels, or if you are joining us on YouTube live in the comment box, enjoy. Thank you so much for this introduction, Sherry. It's, it's great to be with everybody. I've been looking forward to this because uh, this is such an important conference. And it seems to me that uh, what you're doing here in Canada is really setting the pace for many people elsewhere. Um, I wasn't able to be part of the conference in the morning because I was teaching a course uh, for the Academy of economic pluralism, which is an international group that meets in Germany. So this morning, uh, I was in Germany virtually, of course, um, talking from the United States, uh, Nashville, and uh, here I am in Canada virtually this afternoon. So, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, thanks for all the work that has gone into this, and I look forward to the rest of the conference. Uh, let me say, uh, though, that this is not a pre-recorded lecture. I'm actually here. Uh, I'm uh, speaking as you listen. So, so this is this is not a canned event. Um, we thought it might be better actually uh, to do this to do it this way. 
And so uh, let me begin uh, and uh, again, uh, welcome everybody. And I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to the conversation afterwards. I want to start my presentation with a quote uh, that you can see on your screens. This is part of my PowerPoint. I have seen this quote attributed to Che Guevara, but it's not clear whether he actually said it or not. Nevertheless, I consider it a good nature jab that could have come from anyone who is friendly to the left. So here it goes. When the American left is asked to form a firing squad, it gets into a circle. No matter whether Che Guevara now said it or not, there is some truth to this statement. We know that the American right has worked hard to pull together and to build united fronts using all kinds of tools and tricks that I would not necessarily recommend. The American left, on the other hand, is hardly unified at this point. Some on the left are just doing their own thing. In other cases, there is active combat going on. Mechanisms employed are wide ranging, including so-called cancel culture, as well as perhaps less harmful, but still hurtful practices of calling each other out rather than in. The measuring stick is sometimes characterized as political correctness. Before I move on, allow me to clarify what I'm not saying in this presentation. First, I'm not saying that disagreements among the left are necessarily detrimental or that disagreements necessarily amount to firing squads. Second, I'm not saying that the left needs to give up its deep appreciation for diversity and difference. After all, this is one thing that distinguishes the left from the right, and we need to keep it that way. Finally, before anyone suspects me of condemning political correctness, let me note that I'm not calling into question the need for succinct political commitments and positions. Neither am I questioning the need for taking clear stains. What makes the left the left are to a large degree certain political commitments, especially its unwavering commitment to take a stand against structural injustices. Those uh, of course all uh, include uh, injustices along the lines of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and last but not least, also class. This commitment to take a stand against structural injustices is also what makes the Christian left the Christian left. What I'm saying is simply that we need to rethink once in a while that political correctness uh, entails various things and perhaps we need to overhaul our principles once in a while, but that's normal. So what is going on with these so-called circular firing squads on the left and what do we do about them? There are two responses that are quite common, but I do not consider either one of them to be helpful. First, the so-called circular firing squads of the left are often criticized by centrists. Centrists seek to solve the problem by finding the lowest common denominator, that's a common practice, I would say, or by assuming that the truth lies somewhere in the middle. If this is the case, anyone who is not in the middle can be quickly dismissed. And this is what happens uh, oftentimes, especially when you find yourself on the left. If you're on the left and you don't favor a middle road, there must be something wrong with you from a centrist perspective. The second response to the circular firing squads on the left has its own problems. This response seeks a kind of unity on the left that tries to make everyone the same and impose acceptance of the same categorical uh, categories and points of view. This happens, for instance, where the old oppression of Olympics game is played. Here, a singular category of oppression trumps all other categories or seeks to displace them. Let me just say at this point that reductionism cannot be the way to unify the left, including the Christian left. In this presentation, my goal is to investigate if there are other ways to bring together the left, including the Christian left. Before I go on, however, let me add one more comment on the middle road. This is an old German saying, um, by the 16th century poet uh, Friedrich von Logau, 
And he offers this warning. In German, in Gefahr und großer Not bringt der Mittelweg den Tod. Or translated, in danger and dire straits, the middle road leads to death. If there ever was a time that presented dangers and dire straits, it is now. The future of humanity as well as the future of the planet as a whole hangs in the balance. If anything, COVID-19 has alerted us again to this reality as it disproportionately affects those who have been marginalized by the structures of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and class. So we're not arguing for a middle road. There's something more interesting out there, and that's what I want to talk about this afternoon. An old principle of the left is that if a problem cannot be resolved conceptually, it helps to develop a historical perspective. In other words, don't just sit there and think, pay attention to what is really going on. Let's take a look at some of the historical developments and see if this might help us address our problem. In what follows, I'm going to address the Christian left in the United States. I'm doing that not because I'm US centric, but because whenever I lecture outside of the United States, I feel it's more helpful to illustrate things by drawing on the struggles located where I find myself. In this way, I'm not lecturing you about your context and what you need to do, but I'm inviting a conversation in which your experiences help to throw some light on my context and my experiences might help to throw some light on yours. Now, when traveling around the world, uh, today, I guess, uh, it's been reduced to zooming around the globe. Uh, when we're doing that, when I'm doing that, uh, people are oftentimes surprised that there is actually a Christian left in the United States. In fact, some US residents might be just as surprised as you are, as the Christian press has not been getting, as the Christian left has not been getting much press. This is one of the reasons why several years ago, my colleague Kwok Poulan and I decided to write a book about uh, what was then called the Occupy Wall Street Movement, published in 2012, uh, simply because uh, even when Occupy Wall Street happened, there was a lot of conversation about everything and anything, but not about religion. And so even when the religious left is getting some press, it's usually classified as left, but not as religious and certainly not as Christian. But the truth often repressed is that the history of the United States, a country like the United States, cannot be conceived without what some have called progressive Christianity, and that I would like to call today the Christian left. Take a look at the next slide, which contains a list of various crucial movements in US history. And I'm sure uh, you have heard about them all, abolitionism, suffragism, civil rights, eco-justice, Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, the labor movement, and socialism. When any of these movements are, mem are remembered or mentioned, how do you think their history is told? What do we make of the fact that religion played a role? Uh, that's the history that's usually not told. What do we make of the fact though that religion was not only um, one of many things in these movements, but oftentimes central and crucial in what happened? What do we make of the fact uh, that this is not uh, reflected today uh, by, by most people? Of course, uh, we could talk about each of these movements and you will know that each of them has shaped US history in significant and lasting ways. Just want to mention the example of the labor movement. The things that we now for, take for granted, like eight hour work days, the end of child labor, protection for women, pension plans, healthcare plans, all of those were initially fought by the labor movement and also won. This is why, if you enjoy having a weekend off work, you might think the labor movement. But what comes as a surprise today is that unlike today, back then, many of the mainline churches were supportive of these labor struggles as well. And so back then, maybe a hundred years ago, there were much greater sympathies for the religious left than they are now today. This is just a very brief overview, but it gives you an idea that the Christian left in the United States has always been diverse and varied like the left in general. 
In the midst of this, various socialisms also have left their mark and many of them found religious support. This is one big difference compared to Europe, mind you. Their religion was so closely linked to the dominant status quo that working people needed to emancipate themselves. In the United States, on the other hand, religion was more diverse and allowed for different expressions. If in Europe, the critique of religion often meant the rejection of religion, in the United States, the critique of religion could mean the re rejection of dominant religion and the embrace of alternative religious expressions, even within Christianity. Examples include various Anabaptist developments growing out of the left wing of the German Reformation, the so-called free Methodists in the United States, early Pentecostal dynamics, and always the minority traditions such as the black churches. Many of these developments were tied not to utopian socialisms, but to working people coming together and organizing. While utopian socialists in the 19th century established communities all over the United States and the continent, these communities rarely lasted for long. On the other hand, the spectrum, on the other hand of that spectrum was a budding labor movement that began to make history. This movement attracted the interests and support of people who are not often named in the same breath, such as Karl Marx and Abraham Lincoln. Neither Marx nor Lincoln had much of an interest in utopian socialism, but both understood the primacy of labor over capital. This is an insight we might be reclaiming today when COVID-19 has made us aware that none of us can survive without what we're now calling essential workers. Even though people might actually survive without certain handlers of capital, I would add. Note that both Marx and Lincoln were quite clear about the benefit of labor unions. Moreover, both celebrated and welcomed the fact that the emerging working class in the United States was interracial. In 1864, in a letter to Lincoln, Marx famous wrote the quote that you see on your screen, labor cannot emancipate itself in the white skin where in the black it is branded. The record shows that Lincoln actually responded positively to Marx's letter. So there was some correspondence uh, between American presidents uh, and socialists in other parts of the world. This points among other things to a long history of concern for the relation of race and class on the left, including the Christian left. Unfortunately, that is oftentimes forgotten today. While the emancipation of the slaves was a matter of life and death for those enslaved, don't forget it also signaled a broader emancipation of working people everywhere, even though they did not always realize it. As Frederick Douglass noted, the slave is robbed by his master of all his earnings above what is required for his physical necessities, while the white man is robbed by the slave system because he is flung into competition with a class of laborers who work without wages. Southern white workers did in fact not only earn less than Northern white workers, they also made less than Northern black workers. So slavery, Ultimately, uh, what Douglas, uh, as well uh, as some of the others were saying, hurts everybody. Of course, it hurts the slaves more and more seriously, but everybody's affected. Put the other way around, enslavement of African Americans in the United States um, then did a tremendous amount of damage that affected larger people, uh, larger numbers of people than typically realized. According to a recent argument uh, that was just made in the New York Times a few months ago, capitalism in the United States is so harsh in its treatment of working people and perhaps even of its treatment of the environment because it developed in the context of African-American slavery. So slavery here uh, goes deep and it does hurt everybody. I wish there were more time to present the development of the Christian left in detail it is a fascinating history that's much more intersectional than most people realize. In many ways, the concerns of gender, race, and class came together organically in this history, even though, of course, never completely without tension. We're not trying to romanticize these days. 
keep in mind also that the history of the Christian left in the United States is not predominantly the history of white American males, as is often suspected. In the history of the Christian left in the United States, primary agents have oftentimes been women, African-Americans and other minorities. Female African-American civil rights leaders deserve a special place in this history because they brought together the concerns of race, gender and class right there. And then their names include Nanny Helen Burroughs, Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, there are many others but you see what I'm talking about. Let me emphasize here, especially that the Christian left cannot be conceived without the African-American traditions, even though the history of course is complex. For the most part, solidarity therefore was more than just an idea in the history of the Christian left. It was embodied by all those who, who stood shoulder to shoulder in the fight for transformation. Without this kind of solidarity, many of the battles would not have been won. In Frederick Douglass's famous words, which you probably have seen in other places, power concedes nothing without a demand. And that demand, I would add, needs to take the forms of a serious push. Those who think that a few courageous voices speaking truth to power are enough may find that at the end of the day, they may well have the truth, but those in power still have the power. So we need to organize and we need to talk about solidarity. When we talk about solidarity, I've noticed that the notion is getting a bit of a bad rap lately. And so it will take some time to sort through that and to see what it might actually be doing for us. One of the concerns about the notion of solidarity is that it demands a false unity that forces everyone to walk in lockstep. Solidarity apparently makes people look alike uh, and forgets about diversity. Still, as noted earlier, I stick to my guns and I'll argue that neither centrism nor reductionism will do. Neither one will provide us with the solidarity the left needs. To repeat what I said in the beginning, true solidarity cannot be built on the lowest, con uh, lowest common denominator or on any kind of reductionism. It might be possible, of course, that solidarity is overrated. I'm pretty sure that the status quo feels this way. If you think from the perspective of the dominant system, it's always easier to negotiate with a few people and admit them into the system than to have the whole system challenged. Moreover, the dominant system has no trouble celebrating diversity if those to be celebrated are in the minority rather than in the majority. Without broad-based solidarity, the system is only ever forced to deal with minorities, which are easier to handle than majorities, especially when they can be divided against each other. So who really benefits when solidarity is done away with and who loses? Since the powers that be are not interested in the solidarity of the masses, they devised ways that allow them to deal with smaller units which they can handle. Professionalism is a case in point. Professional virtues can be adapted to serve the powers that be because they promise certain people a place in the system in exchange for not rocking the boat. Even well-meaning tasks of inclusion and hospitality can point in that direction. It is easy for the powers that be to be inclusive and hospitable when they own the house where hospitality is offered and when they control the system into which minorities are supposedly included. So we need to do something more than that, but how do we reclaim solidarity? First, I think we can illustrate this by talking about solidarity gone wrong, beginning with the political right which is, as you know, closely aligned with the Christian right. What is it that unites, what is it that unites right-wing perspectives? Figuring out how the right produces solidarity is crucial because it helps the left realize what it is up against, and it can help to understand better the deeply problematic forms 
of solidarity. So when I say solidarity, this is what I'm not talking about. Uh, this is the problematic forms of solidarity. The first example of solidarity gone wrong is the old divide and conquer method on which the right has always thrived for thousands of years, and certainly in this country since its beginnings. This method produces an odd solidarity on the right. Divide and conquer is particularly useful if you can divide the people who actually make up the majority in this country, namely the working class. Don't forget that approximately two thirds of the US population belong to the working class. That is if you define the working class as people who have fairly little power over their own work. That includes a lot of people. And if you can divide white, black, and Latinx workers, if you can divide male, female, and queer workers, you have made substantial progress because then you only ever need to deal with minorities. We're finding out today how well this is working in the United States, and it is scary. By the way, divide and conquer also works beautifully in churches. If you can divide male, female, and queer Christians, you can then divide, sorry, uh, if you can divide male, female, and queer Christians, you can then define and control the meaning of Christianity. You might call it orthodoxy. But there is another strategy on the right that is just as powerful. I've come to call it unite and conquer. This is the foundation of the so-called Southern strategy in the United States that has been powerfully employed in Southern politics since the 1960s. And this is what Donald Trump is using to great success right now. Here, white supremacy and white racism are employed to unite wealthy whites and not so wealthy whites with the goal to conquer. But can you guess what is being conquered here? Of course, white supremacy effectively conquers both racial and ethnic minorities in the United States. But there is something else that is usually overlooked. White supremacy also conquers working and even middle class white people. How is that so possible, you might wonder? Don't all white people benefit from white supremacy? Of course, uh, white people benefit from white supremacy. But white supremacy conquers working and middle class white people by making them believe that they have more in common with their white superiors than with their fellow black and brown working and middle class comrades. Can you guess who benefits from that kind of white solidarity? In the 1930s, W.E.B. Du Bois once again pointed out the connections of race and class in the United States, the ones that Karl Marx and Frederick Douglass had observed earlier. Racism, Du Bois said, not only meant that black people could be enslaved and exploited, but that wages for white people could, kept, could be kept low as well. And don't just think about wages, think about power also. So what needs to be done in response to these utterly distorted forms of solidarity? A first step is to, to address the time-honored unite and conquer method. The problem is summarized by African-American historian Barbara Fields. She notes that the question is not white supremacy in general, but which whites would be supreme. She writes, and I quote, not all white people have the same power and not all white people are in the same class position. Here, I would argue we need to make a distinction between privilege and power that is oftentimes overlooked. Under the conditions of white supremacy, all white people have privilege, whether they realize it or not. Racial privilege conveys many advantages in the dominant system and it is a systemic issue. I think this is what we have been learning today with new urgency and COVID-19 has opened our eyes once again, a little bit more to that reality. That's white supremacy, but don't forget that power is also a systemic issue. And even though all white people benefit in some ways from white racial privilege, they don't all have the same power. White warehouse workers enjoy white privilege when compared to black and brown warehouse workers, 
but they do not have the same power, economic, political, cultural, than white warehouse owners. And they certainly don't have the same power than the billionaire heirs of Sam Walton. This insight can, can come as a rude awakening, not only to white working people, but also to white professionals and white theology professors who certainly enjoy a great deal of, of white privilege and even some power, but whose power to truly shape the system is often surprisingly limited. Of course, the dominant system loves it when people confuse privilege and power. This is actually a trick that's being played on us. The white male straight middle-class Christian who is thinking that he can change the world because of his racial, gender, and sexual privilege is rarely much of a threat. Without solidarity, even the white middle class is left high and dry when it comes to its ability to run the world. And it is time that the white middle class realizes that it cannot change the world by itself. This insight alone will change the nature of activism in profound ways, uh, and I'm hoping uh, that we may have a conversation about that at the end. So now, um, how can the left and especially the Christian left unite, having said all that? Being worried about the political and religious right unified by racism and sexism certainly helps, and Donald Trump has been a major help in making people worried. That sounds Ironic, but it is true. Uh, there's some organizing going on. There's some new energy going on on the left, which is a good thing. But as bad as things are now, this is not enough. African-American studies professor Kianga Yamata Taylor in her brilliant book from Black Lives Matter to Black, Lives Li uh, to Black Liberation talks about a potential for solidarity. And she says this potential for solidarity has to do with the fact that when one group of workers suffer oppression, it negatively affects all workers. There is according to Kianga Yamata Taylor, and I quote, a material foundation for solidarity and unity within the working class. There is, I repeat, a material foundation for solidarity and unity within the working class which I believe uh, on the Christian left, we're oftentimes overlooking. I've dealt with this in my own writings uh, for several years, but it is a tough conversation to have. But let's talk about these material foundations for solidarity, because what this means is that solidarity is not primarily merely a moral imperative for well-meaning people. The potential for solidarity is not a pious dream, but rooted in the realities of exploitation and oppression that affect the many, not just the few. Let me add that this was one of the lasting insights of the Occupy Wall Street movement's recognition of the difference between the proverbial 99% and the 1%. Taylor pushes the boundaries of progressive politics when she notes that the popular idea of white people becoming allies to black people, I quote, doesn't quite capture the degree to which black and white workers are inextricably linked. Let me repeat that. She observes that the popular idea of white people becoming allies to black people doesn't quite capture the degree to which black and white workers are inextricably linked. So there's something deeper at stake than merely being allies. I think I need to pause here for a minute as this is a lot to take in in a short amount of time. I also realize that what I'm saying here cuts against some of the pro popular progressive narratives, including the ones told by progressive Christians. In fact, many progressives, many progressive Christians might be worried that this kind of solidarity talk amounts to erasing the differences between black and white people, and it amounts to letting white people off the hook. Worse yet, such talk of solidarity might neglect the, deep, the deeply meaningful Christian processes of confession of sin and repentance for white racial privilege. I hope we can agree that erasing the differences between black and white and letting white people off the hook is not 
how solidarity is built. Erasing the differences between black and white and letting white people off the hook is not how solidarity is built. But in the process, we need to rethink the meaning of confession of sin and repentance for white racial privilege. Of course, confession and repentance can mean contrition, regret, and sorrow, but these attitudes are fairly meaningless without actively fighting sin and working towards liberation. I would argue that confession and repentance might indeed be practiced where white working people break the bonds of white supremacy by siding with their black and brown brothers and sisters and standing together, that's your solidarity, standing together against the dominant interests represented by the powers that be. I imagine that something like that happened in the Jesus movement as well. Remember, there's this awkward passage in Luke chapter 12, where Jesus talks about bringing struggle rather than peace. There's also passages in the prophet Jeremiah, who in two of the chapters of his book, chapter six and eight, talks about false peace. They have treated the wound of my people carelessly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. So the kind of solidarity that I'm talking about here is not about letting anyone off the hook and neither it is, is it about claiming sameness and identity. Members of the 99% are not all alike, and this would not even be desirable. Solidarity is grounded in the fact that the few are benefiting at the expense of the many, and that this can only be changed by the many, not by the few. So we need to figure out how to move from minority politics to a politics that actually brings together the majority of people who are not benefiting from this system anymore. Now, it's this solidarity, I grant you, that may well be what capitalism is most worried about. What happens when the minorities and women it has been able to exploit so well over the years, speeding up the race to the bottom for everyone, what happens when they unite in some, sort, some form or fashion? Barbara Fields uh, once again helps us to see things more clearly when she says, when she points out, we're living in the midst of the most, un this is a quote from Barbara Fields from an interview two years ago, we're living in the midst of the most unrelenting and successful period of class warfare in American history. The targets are working people, all kinds of working people, and the more we allow ourselves to look away from structural political reasons for it, the more we're helping those who have their feet on our necks. While she said this about two years ago, I would say that COVID-19 is revealing this reality in even more dramatic ways today, as well as some of the other actions, uh, including the police actions against African Americans in the United States that we have been seeing now for quite a while. But what's interesting to me in, in this way of thinking is that we need to be addressing the question of, of social class because without it, capitalism will continue to flourish as will racism, sexism, heterosexism with all detrimental consequences for everyone. So this is how things are ultimately connected. Now, reclaiming class in this context does not mean everybody look alike or pretending that racial, ethnic, gender, and sexual differences do not matter anymore. Barbara Fields, one more time, helps us clarify the misunderstanding. This is uh, a bit of a quote I want to read here from Barbara Fields, um, African-American historian. When someone, she says, when someone in the press says, working class or working class voters, they invariably mean white people. They forget that most African Americans in this country are working people. Most Latinos, however you define that ambiguous term, are working people. Southeast Asian migrants, most of them are working people and indeed the same is true of a good many East Asian migrants as well. Let me start summing up 
what I've been trying to say here. The solidarity which I'm suggesting in this presentation accomplishes two unexpected things. Not only is it built on the respect for differences, it also manages to employ differences for the common good. These differences can be multiple tied to race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, but they could also be tied to religion. So for the solidarity that we're talking about, differences are not only to be tolerated, they're absolutely necessary. And this is what makes all of us stronger. Intersectionality is crucial, but so is interreligious dialogue. That may be a paradox, but I think this is the crucial point here. Solidarity is not about sameness, marching in lockstep, but it is putting our differences together in new and fruitful ways. To be clear, what I'm saying here amounts to a reversal of anything that the right might call solidarity. The solidarity of the right is guided by sameness and by closely guarded racial and even religious identity. Let me say that again, the solidarity of the right is guided by sameness and by closely guarded racial and even religious identities. The solidarity on the left, of the, on the other hand, is guided by experiences of economic exploitation that affect the working majority, but which worsen when they are compounded by race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality. Significant guidance for solidarity on the left comes therefore for, from those who experience these compounded forms of exploitation and oppression in their own bodies, because they are the ones who truly know what the system is really like. So while solidarity on the right is a top-down phenomenon, solidarity on the left is a phenomenon that moves to the bottom up and where we need to take the various forms of oppression in compounded form seriously in a way that we have never done before. Here, finally, the Christian left needs to deepen its theology. Uh, you might think that I haven't talked much about theology in this lecture, but everything I've said is ultimately deeply theological. The ground here is the incarnation of Christ, Jesus becoming human, that teaches us where God is ultimately to be found as well. That's where that theology is rooted, in God becoming human, in a common working person, a day laborer in construction, which is basically what Jesus was uh, as he grew up. The solidarity of the right is also theological, of course. It offers a theological justification of the status quo, and it's building on the perennial religion of empire. Christianity, unfortunately, has joined that religion many times, and it still does so today. The solidarity of the left, by contrast, provides the tools to constant transformation, building on the revolutionary religious expressions of Moses, the Hebrew prophets, Jesus, and even a radical Paul whom we are rediscovering today. That's perhaps a bit surprising, but even Paul in his own way has some fairly radical things to say that were lost for a long time because people read Paul as another, as just another empire theologian. So this is perhaps the most important thing of what I have been saying. Not only does the solidarity of the left demand transformation, it also provides the tools for it. In my own work, this is what I have tried to develop with the term deep solidarity. And this is something I would be happy to discuss in the following conversation. So the point here is not only that there is an ethical and moral demand on us uh, to move away from these firing squads. The point is that there is something bigger going on where there are tools for transformation material foundations for solidarity that are already out there and that have been at work throughout history. That's the beauty of the history of the left, if we think about it. The United States would not be the same country without the movements we briefly discussed earlier. And I'm sure the same is true in Canada and in many other places. 
and maybe the same is true even for my own um, home country of, of Germany, which uh, in its own way uh, had its developments on the left, even though Christianity oftentimes missed out. So at this point, I want to thank you for your attention, for listening, and I'm looking forward to the following conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rieger. Um, if we were in person, then um, there would be applause, um, but I see some applause uh, happening virtually as well. Um, so we can now receive questions through the chat function and those participants who are tuning in on YouTube live can also share questions that will be relayed to me. Um, as we go, as, as we get going though, I'll share a question. Um, I want to thank you for sharing from the context where you're working now in the US. All of our work is contextual and um, and I appreciate your framing of this contribution in terms of the mutual learning across national, provincial, and state borders that can happen at a conference like this. We have participants tuning in from all over the world, and panels today have already been putting these different uh, contexts in conversation. So you have focused your scholarship on these questions of empire, class, and economic issues in religion for se several decades. And we're indebted to this work um, because many Christians are only beginning to awaken to those issues. And you're also very connected with international networks on the Christian left. So my question is, what have you learned about solidarity in contexts like Latin America, Canada, and elsewhere? Um, in, in those contexts that may look a little bit different, um, but also solidarity across those contexts. Yeah, thank you for that question, Michelle. This, this is really a great question and, and it allows me to uh, maybe also tell, tell some stories. Uh, what, what has always struck me, uh, especially you know, when traveling in Christian circles, is that uh, there is a lot of repression going on. And, and a lot of it, of course, comes from the right, from right wingers. Uh, but it often comes from these structures of empire that include politics, that include economics. And so whenever people who are struggling with these systems get together, it seems like there's immediately a conversation going on. Uh, when we share nodes, you know, uh, we may not all have the same experiences, uh, but there is some deeper understanding that we're up against forces that are bigger than ourselves. So this is why I've talked about empire for a long time, because this is not just a couple of mean people, um, you know, critiquing what's going on today uh, and thinking it's mainly the, pre the problem of a mean president or a couple of bad politicians uh, is really not going deep enough. And so those people who have experienced the system in their own bodies uh, very oftentimes uh, have ways to share things uh, that, that are simply uh, amazing. So, so there are connections here that go very deep. Uh, the way these connections sometimes shape up, uh, this is what I've also appreciated, uh, is that, you know, when you sit down and you work through our Christian traditions again, perhaps, when you start reading the Bible again, when you start talking about Jesus, all of a sudden uh, there is insights into these traditions uh, that I have never been able uh, to find unfortunately, in, in most academic classrooms. Uh, this, of course, also includes my, my German academic background, uh, where, where that just wasn't talked about. And so, uh, for some reason, you know, I, I have sometimes said uh, that uh, talking about Jesus or reading the Bible um, in context like that, you know, I've, for a while I've talked about reading the Bible in the Union Hall, because this is what we did, uh, is in a way uh, what is needed if you really want to deepen and understand our Christian traditions. So uh, when you take this to Latin America, for instance, um, those who remember the beginning of, of uh, Latin American liberation theology will remember uh, that there used to be the Latin American base ecclesial communities. And what tied these groups together is that they actually read the Bibles together. Uh, and oftentimes without theological control, that made a difference. But very often uh, they also read other literature together. Uh, there was a famous comment by a Latin American liberation theologian about Marx, why uh, liberation theology was interested in Marx. And the person just said, 
because the people are interested in Marx. They are reading Marx. So you could read the Bible in one hand uh, and leftist literature in the other, not just the newspaper, right? Uh, and uh, when you think about how these things happen uh, and you realize this is not just a theoretical conversation, I see the Holy Spirit at work there in ways that I rarely see it elsewhere. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions coming in um, from Alison Hari Singh um, in the U.S. Um, she's, she's curious why the Christian right has been more successful in its mobilization efforts and its work as a bloc than the Christian left. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I wish sometimes I, I, I knew the answers to, to some of these questions because that, that would really uh, move us forward a great deal. But what I suspect here, uh, of course, is uh, the Christian right, as, as I tried to uh, demonstrate in my lecture, is really using some unfair tools, you know, this divide and conquer method. Uh, it is then also, uh, you know, a unite and conquer method. Uh, people sometimes wonder why so many working people are voting against their own interest. Uh, well, it's not really the fault of the working people. It's these delusional tactics that are presented to them. Uh, this is what they're made to believe. You know, it's the racism that ultimately they're racist, right? Uh, but their own racism uh, hurts themselves. Uh, and so, so some of this is, is uh, you know, it's almost as successful as, uh, you know, eating a sugary diet, uh, which may be very tempting. And a lot of people do, you know, a lot of Americans, of course, in the US are overweight. Uh, so you could see how these things attract people. Uh, the more interesting question is why 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 has the Christian left uh, not not been so successful? And I, you know, this this is the hard answer here uh, that I was trying to give in this lecture cautiously and carefully. Uh, I think too often times uh, when we try to find to come together, we either use the tools of centrism or the Olympics of oppression, which don't work. It's not really a good way to win anything. Uh, or then uh, we just make each other feel bad. Uh, I mean, I see this in the classroom a lot, you know, where uh, then some people want to make an argument that if you have a class analysis, automatically you cannot have a race analysis or a gender analysis. And so there's this constant fighting of the identities that is going on uh, that certainly doesn't allow us to work together, but it also does not really allow a much more... Um, constructive solidarity that's not so much about working together but actually making progress in a way you know that uh, these identities don't have to be dissolved they could be celebrated uh, but that's that's what we're working on and so so the suggestions that I'm uh, bringing uh, to the floor here are also grounded in real life uh, some of it I see for instance happening in uh, the labor movement uh, now not that the labor movement is without fault uh, but if you think about it, uh, you know, back to the march on Washington in 1963, which was a march for jobs and freedom, you had uh, some elements there uh, that already brought together race and class. Um, maybe they had to do a little bit more work on gender back then, uh, but that's the kind of work that we're doing today. Uh, this is one of the things we're trying to do at the Wendland Cook Program in Religion and Justice that I'm directing here at Vanderbilt, where our focal, focal points are on uh, economic justice and ecological justice uh, with an explicit focus on labor. I think that's the one uh, that could help us unite uh, the left in more constructive fashion, because ultimately, uh, as you know, some of these quotes were saying that I was reading, working people are not primarily white men in blue overalls and hard hats. Working people are uh, majority women, minorities, immigrant labor. Uh, you put all of that together. Uh, and when you say labor, the various forms of oppression are already built in and I think what's also built in here, that's the beauty of it, is uh, the building of power and the overcoming of these oppressions. So, so that's the bonus here where, again, I would say the spirit is at work. Thank you. You know, picking up on um, exactly this emphasis that, that uh, we maybe need to talk about class more than um, happens often in theology, um, Sherry DeNovo uh, says, it's great to hear 
a class analysis. It's rare these days. The slums and grinding poverty of developing countries where Canadian extraction and other imperialist countries exploit workers like slaves in, in slave-like conditions often mask the brutality of capitalism. And so uh, Sherry asks if you could uh, connect the dots, say something um, more about imperialism in relation to class. Uh, yeah, I want to start with this notion of the brutality of capitalism. Th thanks for putting it out there so clearly, Sherry. Uh, you know, uh, when we did this interview uh, a couple of weeks ago, I really felt uh, there was a kindred spirit. So, so thanks for for asking these questions and and, and for for thinking about that. Uh, since I've also talked about slavery, uh, let me say something about uh, slavery uh, that may come as a surprise. Uh, there's work done by an author, I believe his name is Kevin Bales, uh, who has written on slavery in modern day times. And what Bales has said is that today there are more slaves in the world than ever before in history. This is not uh, to play down uh, the history of slavery in the Americas, uh, but it is simply to say uh, that the brutal face of capitalism that we might think maybe is a thing of the past is actually still with us. Uh, and keep in mind that a lot of these slaves are actually among us here, uh, even in the North. So it's not just a matter of uh, people being slaved around the world in other countries, uh, but there are sweatshops, there are uh, immigrants held uh, in subhuman conditions. Uh, and what's so horrible about these slaves, uh, says Kevin Bales, uh, is that they have become totally expendable. In the US system of slavery in the plantation south, uh, this is a horrible thing to say, but uh, at least a slave uh, for a slave owner meant a sizable investment. So, so slaves uh, had slightly better treatment because they were um, valuable economically. I, I, I hate to say it that way, but what Bales is saying that today, slaves do not have any value at all anymore because they're completely replaceable. So, so this is uh, one of the brutal faces of this, this imperialism uh, that we're oftentimes not noticing. Now, if, if you look sort of uh, what's happening around us though, uh, and I mean, I, I travel around the world enough, uh, also the global South that, that I have seen a lot of these things that are going on. Um, what is really amazing to me is uh, how even uh, sort of average working people in our own times, in our own places are, uh, are treated. And here I need to talk about the United States, uh, you know, what happens when a working person does not have health care. Uh, this is also a brutal thing because it literally means that there are people dying behind closed doors simply for the lack of health care. So this system kills. I mean, this is actually what Pope Francis said in one of his encyclicals, right? Uh, this system, this capitalism kills. Um, now, the more we look at these examples, I think it's helpful uh, to look at the extremes, but it's also important uh, to look at how this imperial system comes back home because uh, what we're observing even in the academy is what some might call proletarianization, you know, where even university professors, I happen to have a name chair at a major university in the United States, uh, where even uh, people uh, like ourselves are no longer uh, in the position of power and influence that they once had because of the corporations taking over. So the corporate university these days um, may still have a semblance of faculty government uh, or governance. It, 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 it's not that much of it uh, left anymore. Uh, and so the more you look, uh, you have to say that these imperial conditions go all the way down. It's not just a matter of uh, material uh, lack. It's also a matter of control of, uh, you know, cultural relationships, uh, personal relationships. And what worries me most as a theologian, this imperialism ultimately shapes our theology. So the way we're dealing with people ultimately defines the way uh, we're talking about God. Our images of the other, uh, of course, shape our self images, but they also shape our images of God. And so for more and more people, I think God becomes this heavenly tyrant, uh, which is why a lot of people are also leaving Christianity and, and religion uh, because it has sort of adopted some of these imperial methods. Uh, if we talk more about examples, I'm sure we could share many atrocious examples of what's going on, but, but thanks for, for asking that question. 
So um, picking up um, on what you were just saying about leaving Christianity, I think Matthew Cook's question is, is uh, uh, asked, asked to differentiate that a bit. He says, can we speak of Christianity anymore? Um, he says, I, I find that when we talk about Christianity as quote unquote the problem, we're actually talking about a very specific type of Protestantism that emerged out of the US, particularly US slave owners. And for this, Ma Matthew would like to name that as its own entity and not risk uh, being lumped into a very specific movement of capitalist Christianity. Yeah, thanks for that question. I, I appreciate it. This this is a good one. Um, there, there's an interesting phenomenon. I, I addressed this in, in the, one of my recent books that was mentioned in the introduction, uh, Jesus versus Caesar, for people tired of serving the wrong God is the subtitle. That's tongue in cheek, right? People tired of serving the wrong God. But what I'm actually saying is uh, there is um, a form of Christianity that is serving the wrong God, or if you want to use uh, theological language, uh, that is committing idolatry, uh, and 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 therefore not really Christianity anymore. So, so I think that's a conversation uh, that we really should should uh, have uh, also in theological terms. It's it's not just a question of Christianity doing bad things. Uh, that's certainly serious, and and we have to take that into account. Uh, but it's really Christianity distorting, completely distorting, and maybe turning uh, on its head uh, all of its foundations and, and all of its traditions. So uh, when I earlier talked about interreligious dialogue, uh, I, I really believe uh, we need to have more of that. Uh, but that now includes an insight that uh, perhaps uh, while we need to connect with other religions, we also need to draw some lines within our own religion. So, so here, um, I'm not talking about interreligious dialogue with Christian, right? I'm actually saying that we have to address evil uh, where evil happens. And as we might be dialoguing with others, uh, we, we may have uh, to say the no uh, that the German, the well, not the German theologians, but a few German theologians uh, are saying to fascism uh, during the time of uh, Nazi Germany. So, so that, that is definitely uh, one of our challenges, I, I would agree. Uh, the question is, how do we approach it? Uh, and, and how uh, do those of us who would like to have this conversation get together and actually talk about true Christianity? Because I think that's, that's possible. So it's not just a negative argument. It's also a positive argument where we have to redefine what we even mean when we say Christianity. Yeah, um, thank you. And just to kind of put a, a, a different spin on this one, um, you know, there, there's a kind of uh, Canadian slant to this question, which is um, uh, about, you know, perhaps it's not Christianity that's the problem, it's US slave owning Christianity that's the problem. And, um, and so, you know, would you, uh, would you let other Christians who happen to be capitalists off the hook here? Um, maybe maybe I, I didn't hear the question quite right. Why why would I let anyone off the hook? I guess would would be my first question. Why why would this even occur to someone that <laughs> uh, you know someone else is home free? You know this this is of course the way. Uh, when when I wrote this book, uh, Jesus. Uh, sorry, uh, not, this is an, an earlier book. This is not Jesus versus Caesar. I published a book uh, titled uh, Christ and Empire which was translated into German, and I presented this at, at several German universities. Uh, one of the questions I always got from the Germans uh, was, you know, why, why should we bother about empire? That's your American problem. You guys have this problem, we don't. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, then we always had to have some tough conversations, whether not only, uh, you know, this is the case or not, uh, but really asking the question, uh, what does it mean to be an empire? And so uh, if your empire is merely defined uh, by the worst atroci atrocities, uh, I think uh, you're really missing uh, the, the deeper argument uh, that is looking as, uh, at, at how these things shape us all the way to the core. Um, there can be very nice imperialists. You know, you had this in colonial times. Uh, Germans, by the way, uh, this is a, a Schleiermacher kind of imperialism thought. They were the nicer imperialists because they could bring education um, and 
and uh, basically civilization to humanity, but it's still imperialism. So, so no way of, of letting anyone off the hook here. Okay, I have a question here from um, uh, Rich Procida. Um, apologies if, that, if I did not pronounce that correctly. Um, it's a question about propaganda. Uh, Rich says, you present an idealized view of the left. In doing so, you miss a lot of propaganda, including establishment propaganda, third party propaganda, and foreign propaganda. It's dangerous to believe that we are somehow immune to propaganda and are not under its influence when in reality propaganda is used extensively on the left. Have you studied uh, the influence of media and domestic um, uh, and foreign propaganda on the left? Well, that's, that's a broad question. Uh, I, I, I wanna start with this first comment, uh, presenting an idealized view of the left. Uh, that, that was not my intention. And the principle I quoted in the very beginning saying that when you cannot solve a problem conceptually, you have to historicize. It's really also a way of saying uh, you have to look at what's actually happening there in people's lives. And so if you look at the various movements, of course, you can figure out uh, that there are all kinds of struggles. There are all kinds of tensions. Uh, that's human. And, and that's part of being being a person. Uh, that's also the same in religion, you know, the fact that there are struggles uh, between, say, denominations or churches or church people or religions. Uh, some of that is just the way life goes. So um, if, if that was the impression, I, I have to apologize that that was not my intention. Uh, but your question is about, uh, you know, how are people influenced by propaganda? Well, uh, the truth is everybody is influenced by propaganda. So it's not like uh, this is a specific problem uh, for the left. Uh, the more interesting question is uh, whose propaganda are we talking about and who has an interest in this? Uh, and there, I think I would need to know a little bit more about uh, what, what is on your mind uh, because uh, propaganda comes from, from any kind of um, direction, but it's a little bit like racism. Uh, when racism is defined, uh, a lot of people talk about prejudice, uh, but racism really is prejudice plus power. I'd say it's the same about uh, same with propaganda, right? Uh, propaganda, of course, is also prejudice, maybe biased information, uh, but it really gets dangerous when you talk about propaganda plus power. So, uh, you know, if you go on the internet and somebody has their own little website and their own little soapbox, uh, that's one thing. Uh, but when you look at uh, you know, the propaganda that, that actually has power, I think uh, that's the other thing. And there I would say, follow the money. Uh, it's not just a matter of you know, talking about this and that dark power, but it's actually talking about uh, who can fund these things, uh, who is actually behind, uh, you know, um, well, we're talking about campaign financing these days in the United States for all kinds of good reasons, right? Uh, and um, that's what, uh, in my view, uh, would, would have to be uh, studied. Uh, and whether that's domestic and whether that's foreign uh, or where that comes from, uh, I, I think is not the primary question. Uh, it's not a matter of, uh, of nations. Uh, it's really a matter of uh, moneyed interests that, that we would have to be studying. Uh, now, I'm not sure how much of these moneyed interests are influencing a huge uh, uh, pull on the left, uh, but I'm sure there are some out there. Uh, and, and I would uh, welcome your suggestion here uh, and agree with your suggestion that those things have to be studied and observed. Thanks. Jennifer Henry has a question. In, in attempts to unify, quote unquote, that I've experienced, there are strong temptations to sequencing. Like we have to win this struggle before moving to the next. What are the theological or biblical resources to resist this? Yeah, that, that is a really great question. Th thank you for that. Uh, and, and by sequencing, you know, uh, sometimes uh, I, I get a little allergic uh, even when people sort of rattle off race, class, and gender. Uh, because very often these things also get addressed in sequences, right? So, so we have this, and then we have this, and then we have something else, uh, and then it, it's an additive solution, uh, or you think you can solve one uh, without resolving the others. Um, our argument here, of course, is, uh, and I think this is what you're getting at, uh, is that we need to have a more um, integrative position. 
Now, uh, theological and biblical resources, uh, I, I'd have to think more about that. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you start thinking about various liberation stories in the Bible, um, I think that there, there's some really interesting material. I, I keep coming back to the Exodus. Uh, one thing uh, that's oftentimes uh, not addressed with the Exodus is that this is an ancient tradition that actually connects three religions, uh, Christianity, of course, Judaism, but also Islam. Uh, and if you read some of the Islam, uh, or sorry, uh, some of the Exodus stories in the Quran, uh, you get some things that you don't get in the Bible. For instance, that um, at the end of it all, Pharaoh's wife uh, supports the slaves instead of the Egyptian empire. Uh, that may be a little uh, detail here, but uh, it already uh, points to women's agency in, in the liberation of slaves. Uh, and, and there are a lot of other clues in that particular story, right? Uh, it's uh, the Hebrew midwives, Sipra and Pua, who uh, ultimately save the baby Moses, right? From, from being killed uh, by Pharaoh's troops. Uh, and then you have another uh, operative, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, uh, you know, uh, in, in the Christian story. And then when Moses is called uh, to lead the people into freedom, uh, not only is he joined by, by his brother Aaron, but also by his sister Miriam. And, and so, I mean, already there, uh, I think you, you, you have a gender element. Uh, I mean, you could probably talk about ethnicity too, and, uh, and those kinds of things. Um, of course, in the ancient days, I think uh, without uh, too much identity politics, uh, it, it was perhaps more understood uh, that, that these things are together. Uh, I think you find the same thing in the Jesus movement where, uh, you know, um, there's ongoing uh, endless debates about Jesus's own attitude towards women. Uh, but I think we can agree that there's something unusual there. Uh, and then, of course, very quickly, he moves outside of, uh, you know, uh, the boundaries of what's accepted religion, what's accepted culture, what's accepted ethnicities. Uh, and you could say, well, he's just a good liberal. He loves everybody. Uh, but I would say maybe this is the way of organizing. This is the way actually of, of moving the revolution forward. Uh, and then the same thing uh, is, is what Paul's doing, right? Oh, he's just uh, another uh, empire theologian, people would say. Uh, but maybe what he's doing is actually bringing together uh, these uh, various different um, groups in, in a more progressive movement. That's good. Morgan Bell uh, thanks you for your incisive presentation. And he is wondering about the ecclesiological upshot of your suggestion that we embrace deep solidarity. So this is a question about the church. Okay. Beyond individual leftist Christians constellating with each other and other political partners, what would you envision as the role for the churches, congregations, denominations, in fostering that solidarity? Um, so can you trace the theological contours of that ecclesiology for us? Yeah, I mean, those are really all great questions. Uh, and, and thanks especially for that one. Um, you know, there is a difference. I, I think it's sort of coming through uh, slowly as I'm speaking here between a certain liberal uh, effort sort of, uh, of, of opposing uh, the conservative onslaught in uh, a more progressive effort that I would consider on the left. So, so uh, sort of to characterize that a bit, uh, you know, a lot of churches these days uh, pride themselves uh, about becoming more inclusive, hospitable and so on. The problem with hospitality and inclusivity, as I was sort of insinuating in my lecture, is that, uh, you know, hospitality doesn't really ever address who owns the house. So if you own the house uh, and you're hospitable, you know, the others are always only guests uh, and, and there's a power differential. Uh, so, so that's not the way forward. Uh, inclusivity uh, in some ways is also problematic because it always in, uh, somehow suggests including others into the dominant context. I, I've seen this in, in a conservative church, no, sorry, actually in a liberal church uh, where I used to be a member uh, 25 years ago in Dallas, uh, where the pastor would always say, this is a radically inclusive church. Everybody who walks through these doors is welcome. 
Uh, and, and that's a wonderful statement, right? Uh, but what it meant in that particular church is you have to walk through our doors, you have to sit in our pews, and if you play our game, you're actually welcome, right? Uh, so, so that's not what we're talking about. Uh, I say that uh, because I think it helps us to, to rethink uh, what's, what's really happening in churches. Uh, and for that, uh, I would say that even a class analysis in churches could be helpful because too oftentimes, uh, the class struggle uh, that's going on in society is also going on in the churches. And so no matter if we're inclusive and welcoming, uh, there are some people who are calling the shots. Uh, and in a U.S. situation, it's mostly the donors. Um, so uh, when that happens, the question is, how can we build solidarity? Well, uh, you always build solidarity by organizing. So how would you be organizing a church? Well, I would say from the bottom up, uh, rethinking what's most important. A lot of people think uh, in the church most important is the word that's preached from the pulpit. Well, maybe uh, what's equally important is the word that's done in Sunday schools, uh, is popular readings of the Bible, popular education, uh, not as translating things down to people, but really as, as, as moving things uh, again from the bottom up. There was an old adage, I, I happen to be a Methodist, there was an old adage about John Wesley as a folk theologian uh, that was coined by Albert Outler, one of the great Methodist scholars. And what Outler meant by that was Wesley was a really smart guy, Oxford trained, and he could speak in, in simple terms so that the people could understand it. Uh, the question that was never asked is uh, what happened the other way around? What is it that the folk theologian actually learned from the people? How was the folk theologian reshaped by the people? Uh, I have put this question out there with Methodist historians for literally 20 plus years. Uh, and so far, we have not seen a single study of it. Uh, not only because this would be hard to do, uh, it's, it's more work uh, to study from the bottom up, uh, but also I think because this would actually challenge some of the dominant church structures. So, so solidarity here as it gets built from below uh, it's not just an ecclesial principle. I think it's also an epistemological principle, a theological principle. Um, and, and it would ultimately reshape the organization of churches. I mean, the way, you know, we do uh, conferencing, uh, the way we actually do meetings, uh, the way we do decision making, uh, it, it would, uh, I think, add something uh, to, to democracy and all these kinds of things. Uh, well, I wish I could go on uh, more because that's such an important question, but uh, thanks for putting it out there and, and for making me think about it. Yeah, thank you. There's definitely more to think there about um, our churches. Now, um, I have the next question in my queue came to me directly, and I want to join it with Cheryl Johnson's question because both of them are about the secular Canadian context for this kind of work. So Shangping Guo says, um, you know, religious identities can be one of the identities of an in individual. How can a Christian left viewpoint um, help us to understand Christian solidarity um, within a secular community in Canada? Right. Where, you know, this is um, this is uh, this is a big question that I have as well. Um, where in the U.S., it's obvious that the churches are the place to mobilize on the left um, and, and the right, but um, and that's not necessarily so obvious here. Um, so you know how to do this in, in a largely secular environment. And then um, Cheryl's question is also um, uh, related to this. Um, wondering about the intersection of the. Um, decline of mainline churches in the Christian left and the um, and the possibilities for solidarity and radical action. Um, Cheryl says, how can we address survivalism um, and instead direct um, towards radical work for justice, regardless of whether or not the church survives? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that was um, years ago, uh, I remember reading Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, and, and I think it actually uh, sounds better in, in Spanish, uh, where he said, uh, the task of the church is not to survive, but to serve. 
um, and I guess it works in English too, right? Uh, serving and uh, surviving and serving. Uh, where I think this is very clear with the Jesus movement. I mean, Jesus is not in not concerned about the survival of the Jesus movement or anything. He's interested in the movement making a difference and bringing about the kingdom of God. So the fact that we've come to a situation uh, where it's mainly about survival of the church or of religion uh, shows us, I think, how far away we have moved from our beginnings. And, and, and that's something we, we should really be talking about more. Uh, and I think that's that's also uh, an interesting clue uh, to talking about the secular, uh, which is sort of strange. So so let me uh, just about my own context. Uh, I'm working here in the southeast of the United States, which is very religious, uh, where you can use religious languages. Uh, I've I've taught in Texas for 20 plus years, um, so I, I know the South uh, probably best. But whenever I travel to Germany, uh, I immediately enter in, into a secular context. And, and what surprises me about the theological work that I'm doing, uh, I oftentimes get more interest and more resonance to my theology from secular people uh, than from religious people here in the southeast of the United States, because they're very suspicious uh, if, if you talk religion in a way that they haven't heard in Sunday school before. So, so the challenge here, I think uh, the, the, the separation is not so much between uh, Christians and secularists, uh, but, but it really has more to do uh, with, with sort of the sympathies and maybe it's political sympathies, uh, but it's also, uh, you know, uh, cultural attitudes. Uh, and so there's something in solidarity, that's what I wanted to say, uh, that brings people uh, broadly on the left. This is not a narrow category here, but that brings people together in a way that's quite surprising, where all of a sudden it's no longer a question, are you a Christian or are you an atheist? Uh, but, you know, what do we stand for? What, what are we concerned about? Uh, what is it uh, that's that's worse? You know, I mean, if you think about this in, in Nazi Germany, that's always sort of the easy example, you know, especially for uh, my own German background. Um, if uh, the main point was either survival of the church or somehow uh, we can only talk to Christians, uh, you would have missed a lot of the resistance that was going on because uh, a lot of this resistance actually came from you know people who were not religious or who were atheists or who were not christians uh, and uh, once you think about it this way uh, you, you have a different conversation uh, one of the big points i was making in my book jesus versus caesar was that the biggest challenge uh, for uh, christianity today and i think that's true for the us but also maybe for canada is not uh, Christianity versus atheism or Christianity versus other religions, but it is really Christianity versus Christianity. So what I'm worried about is really how do we uh, make uh, this happen uh, within a Christianity that's more and more drifting to the right. Um, and when we do that, uh, what I found in a secular context is that people actually respect us. So when I go somewhere and say, you know, I'm a Christian, I, so I, I was teaching in this European Academy uh, for Economic Pluralism I mentioned earlier. When I taught there, um, I think very few people were either Christian or that interested. Uh, but when I talked about a Christianity that had some alternative economic solutions, they were really, really interested. And after four days of classes, you know, everybody said, First of all, I did not know that there was something like that going on. Uh, and secondly, I find that very inspiring. Uh, and the point was not to turn them into Christians uh, or to make them look like us uh, or say the creed, but the point was that uh, something that a Christian was doing was actually inspiring. And then people wanted to know more, you know, tell us why, you know, tell us your images of Jesus, you know, tell us about, you know, uh, what's going on with Paul. So, so that's sort of the surprising thing that I find uh, that there is almost a natural solidarity that happens uh, where the separation between religion and non-religion is not the problem. Uh, maybe I could add one more thing. I, I'm giving very long answers here, and maybe it's too long, but uh, it, this, these are all such good questions. Uh, one more thing. Uh, early on in the Roman Empire, Christians were actually... Um, charged with atheism. Uh, so some of the Roman philosophers uh, felt uh, that these Christians were not really uh, believing in God. And, and that's easy to see why, uh, because 
their God did not resemble anything uh, that the Roman gods resembled. And, and the Romans were not religiously narrow-minded. It wasn't about, you know, we don't like other religions. I mean, they could uh, integrate other uh, gods in their pantheon, you know, Isis and Osiris and everybody else. Uh, but they could not integrate the Christian God uh, because whatever they were saying about Jesus looked completely unlike an emperor, looked completely unlike... Uh, you know, what theism proclaimed in terms of top-down divine power, uh, impassibility, immutability, and all of that stuff. Um, now, you could say, well, uh, maybe in this situation, the challenge was uh, to say, well, no, we're theists too. Or maybe uh, I think that's the better solution to say, we are actually proudly atheist. And atheism here means we are rejecting all these top-down gods that only bring misery to the world uh, and control to the poor and slavery and all of that, uh, we are rejecting these gods in favor of something else, uh, Jesus Christ, you know, the God of Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and that's something uh, that you can talk about with atheists. I mean, I've, I've done this many times, uh, and it's fascinating because all of a sudden, maybe a Christian has more to do with an atheist uh, than with a theist uh, who believes in the religion of the empire. That gets us back to this question of what we call Christian. Wow. Wow. Um... Thank you. That it, it's coming time for us to close our conversation. And at the same time, um, there are some really exciting things happening in the chat box. So if I could just invite everybody to take a look at that. Um, we have uh, a couple of um, comments. Um, Carol Schick on um, US distorted views of Christianity um, from uh, Gustav Ineza on, um, on the ways that church funding can, can play into the, the Christian left and the Christian right um, and skew the emphasis. Um, a great question from David Lapano um, that I'm hoping that some of the, the um, panels from for tomorrow, which are specifically on academic, uh, excuse me, economic issues, question about class. Um, and so I can see that there are a lot of, um, of very live conversations here. Um, before we close, is there any uh, anything you would like to say in closing? Uh, wow, well, yeah, uh, th this was a really extensive conversation. I, I'm really inspired by the questions because um, to me, they show an awareness of, of the problems that we're up against. And that, that is ultimately uh, maybe the final thing that needs to be said here. I mean, uh, if anybody uh, wanted to idealize either the left or the Christian left or, or anything else, uh, we really have to admit uh, that we're not the powers that be. We're not running the show in this world right now. Uh, and so uh, for those of us who are people of goodwill, who are activists, I count myself as an activist also, I think it's really important uh, that we begin to understand uh, that we cannot turn this thing around, uh, certainly not on our own, uh, that we cannot simply hope that somebody will listen to us without making an effort, uh, and that we really have to look for uh, the bigger energies in the world. I mean, I say this as a Christian, I'm again talking about the Holy Spirit, perhaps. I've talked about the Holy Spirit now three times, um, where there is something going on that we may not be seeing, uh, but that we need to become a part of. So, so my point here at the end is not um, a moral uh, rejoinder, we must do a whole lot or a whole lot more, uh, but it is to say, you know, let's listen to what's already happening. Let's look at the history. Let's look at the resources that we have. Let's look at the movements that are emerging all around us. Uh, and let's see how we can join forces there. Now for Christians, uh, this is the important thing here. Uh, there is no need to water down your Christianity uh, to be in interreligious conversation with other people or in conversation uh, with people who consider themselves secular. Uh, what would be much more interesting is uh, to put your cards on the table and to say, what brings you there? Uh, this is not so much uh, an effort to turn others into your own image 
uh, but it is an effort to give an account of what it is that ultimately moves us. I know other people find that moving. The goal here is not converting anybody or uh, making the church survive, uh, but the goal is, is really to see uh, what it is uh, that is so important in, in what we're doing. And if we ever get to the point uh, where we think that Christianity or theology or the church uh, is not that important, um, maybe we should be honest about that. In my own career, I have sometimes raised this question, I must admit it. Uh, I'm still coming back uh, to saying what we're doing is important. So I want to encourage you to keep doing that and to keep doing that good work. Um, it's very important, I think, that we build these networks uh, because that work can sometimes be frustrating. Uh, but the good news is that uh, we're not alone in this. So, so that's, that's where I want to leave it. Thank you. Uh, please accept our gratitude for um, your willingness to be here with us, to share your work, and to engage with us in this Ernest Crossley Hunter lecture. Uh, really, really grateful. I see the applause uh, coming up around the Zoom meeting. Um, Thank you to all, the, all of the participants of this conference for tuning in. For all of you who are presenting papers for your work on this, um, the, the conference actually continues it a little bit later this evening um, with a session on anti-racism in the Canadian context, which will nicely um, uh, join the conversation with some of the um, contextual issues that Dr. Rieger has shared with us. Um, and we have a full slate of panels tomorrow. So uh, for those of you on YouTube live who may not be signed up for the conference but are interested, um, we can share the link for how you can register for the conference. Um, but uh, in the meantime, friends, thank you for being here. Thank you for um, stimulating my imagination and for um, continuing conversations that we need to continue having. Um, so I will wish all of you a very good evening and hopefully see a lot of you again tomorrow. Take care.